Smart cities is obviously a highly topical subject, not least because of the pandemic. It's almost a cliche to talk about the fax machine as the crunch item of how Germany tried to deal with coronavirus uh, on the outset. And, you know, there are probably still some uh, health offices in municipal authorities across the country that report their corona cases results with a fax, the daily fax. It's become a bit of a laughing stock. And if we look at the international picture, um, Germany doesn't rank very highly on e-government. There was a United Nations 2020 survey on e-government. Germany was not in the top group. Top performers internationally are Korea, Estonia, Denmark, the US is also in the top 10. Germany came in a second batch of countries ranked between South Africa, North Macedonia and the Philippines. And we were outperformed by countries such as Turkey, Brazil, Russia, you name it. And when you look at the municipal level, at the city level, the picture is not much better. Um, there is a regular smart city index by IMD, the business school in Lausanne. No German city is in the top 10 internationally. Munich at rank number 11 was the best German performer last year. Worldwide leaders are considered Singapore, Helsinki and Zurich. So this is certainly a very relevant topic, um, not least with a view to the German election campaign that is just getting into full swing. There was a GovTech summit last week, which very much focused on the issue of what small small startups can do to improve public sector performance. And uh, it was notable that the main political parties all sent their lead candidates to speak there. And there is a lot happening. I mean, the topic is clearly identified as one where the country needs to work. Um, I think in 2007, a, an important law was passed at the federal level. It's called the Online Zugangsgesetz. It's a law that stipulates that from next year, 2022, all administrative services must also be available online. And that's a, a lever for change. And the topic of smart cities um, is also one close to my heart working for Bloomberg here. You might know that Mike Bloomberg, who was uh, mayor of New York, um, has always believed that data and technology can improve the way cities are governed. And he put a lot of that in practice in New York. And just for a laugh, I looked at the smart city digital roadmap for New York from 2011. And it was very interesting for me to see the thesis there that smart cities are not just about digitizing forms and applications that people have to fill in, but it's very much about improving the way the city is governed. It's about making real-time data available, you know, for example, real-time data on public transport or on bin collection, really mundane issues, but things that touch people in their daily lives a lot. So digitalization is not just about making the city government more effective, saving money, more modern, but it can also be a transformative process, how government actually runs and how it's perceived and how it improves the lived reality of the citizens. So without much further ado, our two main speakers are Claudia Nehmert and Victoria Espinel. Claudia is a board member for technology and innovation at Deutsche Telekom, a role she's had since 2017. And she actually has been on the board of Deutsche Telekom since 2011. And if I think back at the time, she was part of a very, very select group of female board members in the German stock index in the DAX 30. Now there are a few more women, but clearly not enough. So Claudia is a true pioneer um, <laughs> for us today. She um, started her career at McKinsey and, um, as I said, has been on DT's board since 2011. Victoria, our guest from the States, um, is president and CSO of, uh, sorry, president and CEO of BSA. There was a rogue S there. Um, BSA used to stand for the Business Software Alliance, and it's an industry body representing the tech giants such as Microsoft, AWS, Oracle, and so on, and also Siemens of Germany. Victoria has a decade of public service under her belt as well. She served for both the Republican and Democratic administrations in the White House. She was President Obama's advisor on intellectual property, and she was the first ever US trade negotiator for intellectual property and innovation. Um, so over to you, Claudia, to kick us off, and then over to Victoria for the answer from across the pond. 
Friederike, hello everyone. Good afternoon, good day, good morning, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure, ladies, to be here uh, with you. So I'm not going to speak about what Germany can learn from the United States or other European countries, rather share a few practical perspectives, what principles that work well in business might work in public sector as well, specifically with regard to smart city. Now, and talking from our own practical experience, the COVID crisis has been a tremendous challenge, but also, and even more so, a tremendous opportunity for a company like Deutsche Telekom, which is a very much of a transatlantic telco, I have to say. Yeah? There was a huge increase of volume. Yeah? For example, Netflix parties at the beginning went up by 3,000%, video conferences by 300%, uh, voice uh, calls by 100%. And um, I must say, as a CTO, I was very happy and relieved that our networks and our IT have been really stable and secure all the time. Um, and now that was not just an accident, I have to say, but the result of historic investments, not only in technology. You could argue it's important to digitize the network. It's important to have fiber. It's important to have 5G. It's important to have a modern IT and leverage data. All that what companies do, but equally so because we decided to invest heavily into the capabilities and the way of working of our people. Because from my point of view, a digital transformation of a company as well as smart cities or public sectors institutions is to a very large extent a capability, a cultural transformation, much more so and I'm saying that as a physicist and as someone who loves technology, then technology, to, technology tools alone. And in our case, because we're a huge organization with 230,000 people worldwide, um, in our case, it was very much around going away from historic principles of hierarchical working command and control, of having here the business and there the IT, and everyone like saying this, from working very iteratively, developing, 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 testing, 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 and then figuring out what is good, to far more iterative processes and more agile working. And for sure, I would add to more diverse teams. But important thing was really to find an avenue to work together, to work more iteratively, and to grant accountability to those people who can fix the problem rather than creating over bureaucratic rules and procedures. Now, saying that is easier than doing this. And I went through my own experience because giving freedom to people and liberating them from, dem uh, from bureaucratic rules does not necessarily suggest that all starts working well, specifically when people got used to work in certain risk aversion type of environments. And what I learned that one important principle is that the leader has to change her or his perspective on the role of leadership. And the most relevant change is not be the one who is most risk averse and thinks he or she is in charge of everything, but realizing that you are responsible for people who are in charge and that you need to keep their back free for potential mistakes that can be done. And then when I thought about it, and I, uh, I'm not going to dwell so much on in this transformation, I was thinking a lot, and I'm discussing that with political leaders across Germany, to what extent can the passion for speed and embracement of those agile principles be applied to public sector as well? And I just want to have three um, foods for thought. Number one, big principle is co-creation. And Friederike, you said it, co-creation together with the people to whom it concerns in the cities, the citizens or the people who are in charge of something. Really iterative co-creation on what are really the most relevant topics for a specific city. And what we see, we've seen it in London and other cities, yeah, where you have a few people who are really passionate to change something, things start to move to really co-creation with the users, with the citizens, and with some people who are really passionate about driving digitization for certain purposes. Yeah, whatever their passion topic is. Number two, understand that the institutions in a city should be more learning organizations. And learning organizations means 
that public sector institutions also in the city should start to leverage more the people who work in business. Yeah, and very often, especially in Germany, there is this, in Germany, we say Berührungsangst, the skepticism. Oh my God, yeah, what's now the commercial thing this company wants to sell to me? But more exchange of people. Um, also um, for, with experiences into the public sector and openness to work with startups, big and smaller companies. So this is what I would call learning and open organization. So, and my last point, in addition to co-creation and creating learning organizations is, to have also the understanding of the people who are responsible for those in charge, that the most relevant leadership role is not trying to avoid risk. And that's difficult, I know, in a political um, atmosphere, but keeping the back free for those who might potentially do a mistake because maybe they killed one rule too much. But moving into a speedy age of digitization means actually um, finding a good way of uh, having all these procedures, the unnecessary procedures explode. Yeah. And by the way, one last final comment, because Deutsche Telekom and SAP were also involved in developing, for example, the Corona Warn app, the discussion that European data protection and data sovereignty standards are preventing innovation from happening. Honestly, I believe that's bullshit. I think it's a huge competitive, a huge competitive advantage. What I believe what hinders us is the interpretation through the bureaucracies of these rules. And this goes back for me to the question how to enable speed and more pragmatic behavior and more maybe a certain type of failure tolerance also in public sector. So that was what I wanted to say from my perspective. It's much more a cultural topic and the question how we enable people to be part of learning organizations and to apply those principles also in public sector. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, that was tremendous. Um, thank you, Claudia and Frederica for having me here today. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor and a pleasure. So my name is Victoria Espinel. I am the CEO of BSA, the Software Alliance, and uh, we represent the B2B enterprise software and tech industry. Um, our job is to work with governments around the world, including in Germany, to modernize laws and regulations, so they keep pace with technology, and I'm very excited to be here uh, today to talk about a, uh, to talk about smart cities and digital transformation um, issues that are that are near and dear to us. So one thing I thought would be useful to sort of note at the outset is that even where we sit today, half of the world's population live in cities, and while that is an impressive statistic, urban populations are continuing to grow. So the most recent estimates that we have is that by 2050, 70% of the world's populations are going to reside in cities. As a former public servant myself, I was a trade negotiator for the United States um, in the Bush administration. And then I was an advisor to President Obama in the White House. I know how hard governments work to serve their citizens. And I know firsthand some of the challenges that they face, including on the technology side. And as urban populations continue to increase, those challenges are going to increase right along with them. So this is really the moment for digital transformation. I mean, it goes by different names, digital transformation, smart cities, IT modernization. But at essence, what we're talking about um, done right, I believe, is combining technology, so data, software, IoT, data analytics, combining technology with good governance, and with input from citizens and taking those three things together to improve the livability of cities and to improve the services that governments offer to their citizens. Um, there are a number of cities around the world that are talking about, Frederica raised some of the challenges um, that we've seen recently in Germany, but obviously uh, there are good things happening here too. So I know in Hamburg, for example, uh, they're using data analytics and sensors to improve the efficiency of the port. That obviously decreases the cost of shipment. It increases the attractiveness of the Hamburg port and the efficiency of it. Um, I know and there are a number of public sector projects that are using something called BIM, building information modeling. And they're doing that, which is a form of digital transformation technology. 
uh, created by BSA members. And they're doing that so that when they design projects, when they design buildings, for example, they are making better design projects and they are making them more energy efficient. So there is there's lots happening. Um, I would say there's still much more that needs to happen. And I think, you know, as we see the private sector going through digital transformation, we are going to see cities moving towards digital transformation as well. What I thought, uh, and I'll make one more general point, not just large cities. So it's, we are seeing um, not just in the United States, but across the world, small and medium sized cities that are embracing digital transformation as well. Let me talk briefly about some of the challenges or some of the considerations that I think cities need to bear in mind as they're going through digital transformation. So I thought Claudia gave a great overview from the business perspective of some of the, the mindset challenges and some of the best practices that companies have adopted going through digital transformation. I think there are also some, what I would call policy issues that cities and companies need to bear in mind as they're going through digital transformation. And there's three in particular that I'm going to highlight. The first is privacy, the second is cybersecurity, and the third is equality. So, um, you know, I spent a lot of my time thinking about the intersection between technology and the impact that it has on the global economy, but also the impact that it has on people's daily lives. So this is an issue that, that I and my organization have spent a lot of time thinking about. And it's really important here because there is no level of government that is more connected to the lives of its citizens than, than cities, than municipalities and local government. So as cities are going through digital transformation, bearing in mind privacy, cybersecurity, and equality are critically important. Um, I'm just gonna speak briefly to them, um, but on privacy, smart city technologies often collect data and use data in various ways. And they're using it to try to make decisions, to try to deliver citizen services in ways that are more efficient. But there is, a, there is an element of that or a necessary component of that, which is the collection of data. And so I think to boil it down, I think the most, and so there are obvious privacy implications there, right? Um, I think to boil it down, the most important thing to bear in mind is no surprises. There, we have a, at BSA and with our member companies, we have very long detailed positions on privacy positions, on privacy policies. But I think it all boils down to people should not be surprised. So as cities are going through digital transformation, they need to make sure that their citizens are not surprised about how their personal data is being collected and how it's being used. They should make sure as part of that, that the companies that make the technology that the cities use are required to responsibly handle citizens' private data in a manner that is highly protective of privacy. Um, I completely agree, by the way, with what Claudia said, that privacy protection and innovation are not in conflict with each other. I, I would say we see this every day and the, the BSA companies, the, the enterprise companies that I represent, um, and Frederica mentioned a few of them, including Siemens, I think are very innovative and very focused on privacy protection at the same time. So those two things do not stand in conflict, but it is very important, I think, to bear in mind the, um, the requirement that people not be surprised with how their data is used and how it's collected. Uh, the second thing I would say is cybersecurity. There have been a number of incidents um, and there will, be, there will be more incidents that, uh, that reflect the, the, the nature of the fact that cyber criminals are becoming increasingly sophisticated um, and they're looking to take advantage of this of digital transformation. They're looking to take advantage of the move to the digital world. One of the issues that we see is that the public sector does tend to lag behind industry in terms of putting in place the most robust cybersecurity measures that exist. Um, I do think that is something that a number of governments are, are focused on, but again, as a, as a former public servant, I know that resources can be tight. Um, that said, I think it is absolutely critical. And I think, and I think governments can be a target for cyber criminals because they are known to be, um, have IT practices or technology that is lagging behind the cutting edge in terms of cybersecurity. So it, it makes them, 
more susceptible. It can be overcome. I think one of the ways to do that is to make sure that cybersecurity is being prioritized. But here's the thing that I would highlight that is being prioritized, not just at the moment of procurement, but through the entire life cycle of the technology. So not just when it's being bought, but that good cybersecurity practices are being implemented throughout the use of the technology and throughout the end of the technology, you know, what the, the end of the life cycle when the technology is being deactivated. So making sure that good cybersecurity practices are embedded every step of the way, I think is critical. Um, the last thing I'll speak to just briefly is that I think policymakers have to be very mindful of as they modernize their technology is equity. And there are two considerations there I would highlight in particular. The first is access. The smart city technology, any kind of technology is only truly effective and truly maximizing the benefits we want to see if it is accessible. And by accessible, I mean easily available to a broad range of citizens. An example of a challenge of the space is access to broadband. Um, I think as government services move increasingly online, a reliable internet connection um, is critical. This, the, the events of this past year, I think have, have only emphasized to all of us how important that is. I do hope that that increased awareness creates an opportunity that we all need to seize collectively to increase access to broadband. Um, and I'm very pleased that in the United States, President Biden and the US Congress have made it a priority in terms of uh, build back better and infrastructure to try to increase broadband access. But I wanna emphasize, at least in the United States, some of the conversation focuses on um, broadband access in rural areas, which is a very important issue, but we also have a digital divide issue in cities. And so we have issues with reliable broadband access in cities as well, which is critically important to focus on. Uh, so, I think there's I think there's a lot of opportunity to make progress there, and I'm and I'm hopeful that um, that that continues to happen. And as I said, that the that the uh, events of the last year have demonstrated how important that is, and that creates an opportunity for us. Um, the last thing I would say in terms of equity is making sure that technology is being used in a way that is both responsible, but also that um, doesn't exacerbate issues of bias, for example, that exist, but instead is used to try to ameliorate that. And um, to that end, I wanna mention specifically, BSA released just last week, a playbook for companies and governments to use in order to mitigate the risk of bias in artificial intelligence. So it is a very detailed playbook that we would highly recommend governments and companies to look at as they are either creating artificial intelligence or using artificial intelligence products to try to mitigate the risk of bias. Um, and we are actually, we are having an event on Thursday with Secretary Raimondo and with EVP Vestager to talk about this issue and to talk about our framework. Um, you are all invited to attend. Um, you can easily reach me at victoria at software.org if you are looking for an invitation. But I think the issue of mitigating bias and in artificial intelligence as part of the larger issue of responsible use of technology and using technology in an ethical way is very important for cities and local governments to bear in mind as they're going through digital transformation. Um, the last thing I'll say is just to pick up on something uh, Claudia was talking about. I've been working for many years with the World Economic Forum on a project related to agile governance. Um, and Claudia, I would love to connect with you on that at some point. I think it, it uh, would really resonate with a number of the things that you were saying. Um, so with that, I will pause, uh, but thank you again so much for having me here today to talk about such an important issue.